We can expand and generalize valence bond theory to generate the theory of molecular orbitals. We're going to talk about molecular orbital theory at least in an introductory way in this video. Valence bond theory has told us that bonds are derived from orbital overlap. Molecular orbital theory generalizes this idea of orbital overlap and tells us what it really means. We've already talked about the fact that orbital overlap is really just the addition of wave functions and what molecular orbital theory allows us to do is add, subtract, and multiply wave functions over multiple atoms, atoms that are not necessarily adjacent to one another in order to generally generate molecular orbitals. The basic tenets are the following. Electrons and molecules are described by molecular orbitals, and these are size that are conceptually really identical to the atomic orbitals, except that they're allowed to extend over the entirety of a molecule. Molecular orbitals have the fundamental properties of atomic orbitals, occupancy, energy, and shape, but they can span an entire molecule. A very important idea of molecular orbital theory is that MOs are weighted sums or differences of the atomic orbitals. And what we mean by that is that if we want to generate a psi that's a molecular orbital, we take the size of the atomic orbitals that are involved and we scale them, say multiply them by a certain constant, C1, and add or subtract them to generate the resulting molecular orbital. So we can do this for any number of atomic orbitals within the molecule, and in fact we might use, in theory at least, all of the atomic orbitals within the molecule, but it's this scaling and adding and subtracting of the atomic orbitals to generate the molecular orbitals that is the hallmark of what's called the LCAO-MO approach. Linear combinations of atomic orbitals make molecular orbitals. This mathematical expression where we multiply each AO by a constant and then add or subtract them together is known as a linear combination. And when we do this, the number of molecular orbitals in a molecule must be equal to the total number of atomic orbitals brought to the party by the atoms. We do this just in case the atoms bring full shells, right? If the atoms bring in full shells, we need molecular orbitals to hold all of the electrons brought in by the atoms. And so the number of molecular orbitals in a molecule is equal to the total number of atomic orbitals of the atoms involved. The energies and shapes of molecular orbitals can provide some valuable information, such as the partial charges on atoms, whether they're partially positive or partially negative, and dipole moments, which tell us where electrons are located within molecules in a pretty general way. Let's look again at H2 and F2 and see how molecular orbital theory differs from the valence bond theory description. So let's begin actually by drawing the atomic orbital energy diagram for hydrogen and for fluorine. This is something we actually already know how to do, right? For hydrogen, we know that hydrogen contains a 1s orbital that contains one electron within it. And I'm actually going to draw that twice for the two H atoms kind of before they've combined with each other, right? We've got, say, hydrogen 2 over here, and we've got hydrogen 1 over here. For fluorine, the picture is slightly more complicated, but let's focus on the valence orbitals only. So the valence shell of fluorine is n equals 2, it's a second row element, and we have a 2s orbital and the three 2p orbitals. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, and so we can fill these up according to Hund's rule and the Aufbau principle, like so. And I'm just going to reproduce this diagram on the other side for the other fluorine atom. So how do we generate the molecular orbitals from the atomic orbitals? Well, honestly, in a general sense, we let computers do this for us. For the diatomics, though, we can actually think about the orbitals that are able to overlap in the sense that spatially they're close to one another and they interpenetrate. And we can think about orbitals adding to each other or subtracting from each other. And so for every two atomic orbitals that combine, we need to get two molecular orbitals out. And for the case of hydrogen, which is the simplest case and very illustrative, we get one orbital that's lower in energy and one that's higher. So if we take the two 1s orbitals and add them together, we get an orbital that's lower in energy. And you can imagine what this looks like from what we've already talked about with the valence bond description. It's just an or orbital with a large lobe between the nuclei that looks something like this. We can also take the two 1s orbitals and subtract them from one another to get a higher energy molecular orbital whose shape actually has a node between the nuclei and lobes of two different signs on either side. 
like this. So we've got a node between the nuclei. What I've drawn in blue in the middle are the molecular orbitals. And since we're talking about S orbitals overlapping, spherical orbitals, we have the sigma and the sigma star. These are called sigma orbitals since sigma overlap is involved. For fluorine, the situation is slightly more complicated. We'll have the two S orbitals overlapping just like we did for the 1s case for hydrogen. In fact, there's no difference whatsoever for those. When thinking about the px orbitals, which are pointed directly at one another like this, we can also generate bonding and antibonding orbitals in a pretty intuitive way just by allowing these orbitals to come close to one another and seeing that they reinforce one another in the middle. So we've got the sigma, the sigma star for the two s orbitals here and here. And we have a sigma orbital for the 2px, which is formed from the overlap that you see on the left-hand side here. We will also have two pi bonds due to the fact that orbitals pointed in the same direction like this can overlap in a pi-type fashion to generate a bonding orbital as well. The y and the z orbitals can do that. So we'll have pi orbitals for the px and for the py. And these, although I'm not doing a good job of showing it, are in fact lower in energy than the atomic 2p orbitals. Finally, we'll have the corresponding antibonding orbitals. So we'll have an antibonding orbital for the two pi orbitals, pi star 2px and pi star 2py. We'll have an antibonding orbital for the sigma 2px, which we'll call sigma star 2px, which will be the highest energy of all. Here's another view of the molecular orbitals of fluorine gas, or F2. So on the right, we have the molecular orbitals in their corresponding symmetry. Si stands for sigma, pi stands for pi. Notice that the lowest energy orbital, about negative 23 electron volts, has electrons within it, has two electrons within it, and has the appearance of what we would expect for overlap between S orbitals. We have large kind of oval shape density in the middle and because these are two s orbitals we do actually have a little bit of wave function of opposite sign on the outer edges here. MO2, well that's the sigma star orbital based on overlap of the 2s, so it's 2s1 minus 2s2 if you like. And notice that we have a node between the nuclei, a sign change, positive density on one side, negative density or negative wave function on the other side. MO3 is our first pi orbital. And notice that it's got this kind of sandwich shape with a lobe on top and a lobe on bottom of opposite sign. And if we really pay attention to how the red and the blue lobes are aligned, and if we imagine, for example, covering up one of the fluorines, we can see which p orbitals were involved in the construction of this molecular pi orbital. See if you can figure this out, which axis are the p orbitals that combine to form this molecular orbital aligned along. Well, it's the z-axis, right? If we imagine the separated p orbitals, they'd be pz orbitals. MO4 is an equivalent pi orbital, just in a different direction. If I leave this fixed, notice that MO3 is at right angles to MO4. Molecular orbital 5 is the sigma orbital formed from overlap of the px orbitals. Notice that the p orbitals are aligned along the x-axis. When they overlap, we get this molecular orbital. MO6 is our first pi antibonding orbital. So notice that it's constructed from the pz orbitals, but there's now a node between the two nuclei because the p orbitals are subtracted from one another such that these lobes have opposite sign. MO7 is another pi antibonding orbital that's just at right angles to the first. And then MO8, which is the last orbital shown here, is an antibonding orbital constructed from the px orbitals where one is subtracted from the other.